This video will contain spoilers for Jujutsu Kaisen chapters 136 and 137 and season 2 episode 23 otherwise known as episode 47 aka the season finale. So the second season of Jujutsu Kaisen is finally closing the gate, and in this series, I've analyzed the story of the series as it aired, and as a manga reader, compared the anime to the manga to see what they pulled over directly, what they modified or expanded, and what they just straight up removed. So let's begin one last time with the 23rd episode of Season 2 of Jujutsu Kaisen. First, I'll recap the plot and explain what chapters it covered. The episode begins right where the last left off, with Yuki appearing to save the day against Getont and Uraume. The two engage in a discussion about their envisioned futures as discussed in episode 5 of this season, episode 29 overall, but Yuki is of course speaking to Geto, who, other than the way he looks, is not the person standing in front of her. Her stance is still that the goal should be to eliminate cursed energy, whereas Geto wants to optimize cursed energy. Yuki points out a flaw in this strategy, mainly that Japan has a virtual monopoly on cursed energy, as so few sorcerers and cursed spirits appear in other countries. In order to optimize cursed energy, Tengen's barrier would be necessary, meaning that only the humans of Japan would be capable of having their cursed energy optimized. The issue is that there are other countries in the world, such as the US and the oil-producing countries of the Middle East, that would notice such a sudden shift in energy output in Japan and would seek to use their methods of influence to gain access to that energy by any means necessary. As cursed energy is produced solely by humans, the implication is that these other countries would attempt to invade Japan and enslave its populace to wring them of their cursed energy like a saturated dish towel. This also relies on the idea that cursed energy is much like any other form of energy and could be used as a source of power like natural gas or electricity, which to this point I don't think has been explained clearly in the series. As Yuki is a heroic character, such a reality is far removed from the one she wishes to see realized. Of course, as Gettont is an all-around piece of shit through and through, he doesn't really much care about all of that. He simply wants to see what the pinnacle of humanity's potential would be via cursed energy, something he's been experimenting with for some time, as Choso and his brother's existence has proven. The issue is, he eventually came to realize that what he can create by his own hands is unable to exceed his own potential. So, in order to truly bring into reality what he wishes to see, he had to engineer a situation in which chaos would bring about what he sought by way of a method beyond his control. Gettont throws out his hand, mentioning that he has already extracted the technique. Yuki realizes what he's up to, and asks Yuji about Mahito. Yuji tells her that Gettont already absorbed Mahito, and Gettont uses Mahito's extracted technique, Idle Transfiguration which he acquired after absorbing Mahito and ejecting him via Uzumaki. He slaps the ground, creating a sigil which is reflected in the sky above the battlefield. Yuki mistakes it as something being done to Tengen's barrier at first, but realizes it's actually remote activation of a curse technique using Tengen's barrier. Yetont thanks Yuji, explaining that a cursed spirit's technique ceases to grow once they're absorbed by cursed spirit manipulation, and Yuji's final battle with Mahito gave him a growth spurt that allowed Gettont's plan to come to fruition. He also mentions he wanted to absorb Jogo as well, but c'est la vie. Yuki asks Gettont what he did, and he explains that he remotely cast Idle Transfiguration on two types of non-sorcerers that he had previously marked. We cut away and see as Megumi's sister, Sumiki, wakes up from the coma she's been in since before the start of the series, the mark from Gettont's Idle Transfiguration on her forehead. The two types of non-sorcerers are people like Yuji, who ingested cursed objects at his behest, and people like Junpei, who had cursed techniques but were born with brains that made them non-sorcerers. Using Idle Transfiguration, he was able to adjust the brains of these people. To the cursed object vessels, he reinforced them to be able to act more suitable as vessels, as not everyone is naturally physically gifted like Yuji. To the sorcerer's sleeper agents, he tweaked their brains to allow them to access cursed energy and use of their techniques, like Mahito did to Junpei. He produces a bow, tied from a short length of silk, and snaps it apart. As the bow crumbles away, 
He says that the seal on the cursed objects he fed to the subjects of his experiment is now broken. Though some of them have been deep in sleep since exposure to his cursed energy when he marked them, they would now soon awaken. He plans to have them fight each other to deepen their understanding of cursed energy. He carefully picked out his subjects and the cursed objects that he paired with some of them, comparing it to unleashing a thousand malevolent Yuji's all at once. Yuki points out that a thousand isn't really that many, and that most people aren't going to start fighting and killing each other just because they were given power. Gettont, of course, had already planned for that, but feels the need to call Yuki stupid for not realizing it. Yuki, now pissed, turns to Yuji and tells him they should go beat him down, but Yuji is still trapped in ice and can't move. As he says that, however, all the ice dissolves as Uraume collapses. Gettone asks what's wrong, and Uraume realizes that they've fallen victim to one of the things reverse curse technique can't help against. Poison. Choso reminds everybody that like Esso and Kechizu, his blood has a poisonous quality to it, and if he mixes it in with the blood he generates via cursed energy when he uses his technique, he can poison people with it. Momo notices that there's been no backup from Mai, and assumes there must be more enemies than the two in front of them. Yuki, however, mentions that her ally, she mentioned LaRue earlier, the heart nipple pasty guy with Aizen's voice actor that used to work with Geto, is protecting Toto, Mai, and Miwa, saying that they don't belong here due to the danger level. Panda asks Noritoshi if he can move, and as he can regulate his body temperature via his blood, he says he has no problem. Kusakabe is done and stays on the ground. Yet Tont is a little miffed as he wasn't done talking yet. He finishes his explanation by revealing that the cursed objects are the remains of sorcerers he made binding vows with 1,000 years ago, effectively meaning the people he fed them to in the modern day and transfigured to act as their vessels are reincarnations of ancient sorcerers. He also mentions that those vows became null when he took Ghetto's body. I think the implication here is meant to be that the vows he made bound him to specific actions or restricted him in some ways, but as those vows are now broken, he's no longer bound by these contractual obligations. Yuki realizes what he means, as he summons a bunch of cursed spirits to cover his escape and welcomes his audience to the new world. He taunts Yuji with the prison realm as he bids him farewell, and addresses Skuna directly. He claims that the world of the Heian era is once again upon them, and that he has ushered in a second golden age of cursed techniques. We cut away to the aftermath of the Shibuya incident. We hear as many people in positions of authority argue and scramble to respond to the incident, one of which claims Gettone to released more than 10 million cursed spirits. We see as a child commits theft by eating a bento in the ruins of the city, obviously scavenging to survive in this pseudo-post-apocalypse. A cursed spirit attempts to lure the child out of the store in a sort of anglerfish-type gambit, and just as it's about to eat the child, Yuta drops out of the sky sword first and murders it. He plays the hero, addresses the child, and as he does so, the cursed spirit is not so dead, but gets splattered against a wall by Erika. Yuta shields the child's eyes from the carnage and leads her away. We cut away to Yuta meeting with the Jujutsu higher-ups, who he believes have now confirmed he will obey their commands by doing as they had said so far. The higher-ups reject this, and he asks if it'll take him entering a binding vow for them to trust him. He mentions that he doesn't care if the person he speaks of was protected by Gojo, it was because of him that Inumaki lost his arm in Shibuya. He declares that he will kill Yuji himself. The Jujutsu HQ issues an edict. First, Geto Suguru has been confirmed to be alive and is sentenced to death again. Second, Dojo Satoru has been confirmed as an accomplice in the Shibuya incident and is immediately exiled from the Jujutsu world. And removing the seal on his prison realm would be considered a criminal act. Third, Yaga Masamichi will be executed for inciting Gojo and Geto and causing the Shibuya incident. Fourth, Itadori Yuji's stay of execution is rescinded, and his execution is to be carried out immediately. Fifth, and finally, Okotsu Yuta has been appointed as Itadori Yuji's executioner. And the episode ends. With the recap out of the way, let's go over the basic points of the plot. 1. Gettone reveals his plan to optimize cursed energy and takes steps to enact it. Using Idle Transfiguration, which he extracted from Mahito after absorbing him, then ejecting him via cursed spirit manipulation and Uzumaki, 
He shifts two groups of non-sorcerers to be jujutsu capable. Those who ingested cursed objects who will now reincarnate as ancient sorcerers, and those with cursed techniques who simply required their potential to be unlocked. He then plans to pit them against each other in battle to deepen their understanding of cursed energy and create a chaotic scenario beyond his control to realize the true potential of humanity. One of these newly awakened sorcerers, of which group we do not know, is Megumi's sister, Sumiki. 2. Gatont escapes with the prison realm and tells Skuna that he has ushered in a second golden age of cursed techniques, just like the world of the Heian era. 3. In the shattered post-incident Shibuya, Yuta is back in Japan and saves a little girl from a cursed spirit that Gatont released. He meets with the Jujutsu higher-ups, who forge a binding vow with him to execute Yuji. They also release an edict that marks Geto and Principal Yaga for execution, excommunicates Gojo and marks unsealing him as a crime, and rescinds Yuji's stay of execution while marking Yuta as his appointed executioner. Now let's get into some analysis. So for this episode, I just want to offer some clarification on some of the things discussed in the episode and things that happened. I found the translation in the manga to be a little lackluster, and I can't imagine it'll be much better in the anime. Unfortunately, there's some more complex language than you usually find in this sort of stuff, and that makes it harder to accurately translate, even for a skilled localizer. I've taken the time to hunt down alternate translations and discussions concerning these chapters to get a better grasp on it. So here's the compiled results of my efforts. First, get Tone's plan. I've explained it twice already, but to give the full rundown on it without getting into stuff that's going to be explained later, which strays into spoiler territory, at least by my standards. What we can take away from this episode is that in the past, Gettont, while in control of a different body, or perhaps even the original body, as he says it was a thousand years ago, made binding vows with a lot of different people, both sorcerers and non-sorcerers, as necessary. He then converted the sorcerers of the past into cursed objects, similar to how Skuna was made effectively immortal by way of his fingers. In the modern day, he then fed these cursed objects to specific people he picked out to be their vessels, though the objects were still sealed and so, inert. After using Idle Transfiguration, which I'll get to in a second, he shifted their bodies and brains to act better as vessels, and then unsealed the objects. After using Idle Transfiguration, which I'll get to in a second, he shifted their bodies and brains to act better as vessels, and then unsealed the objects, thereby causing the sorcerers who were turned into those objects to be reincarnated in the vessels, similar to the way Yuji houses Skuna, but worse, because they probably don't have the unique ability Yuji does to force control of his body back from Skuna. That's one half of what he did. The other half concerns people born with cursed techniques who couldn't use them due to their brain developing in such a way that they couldn't access their cursed energy. For these people, he used idle transfiguration to transform their brains in order to use cursed energy, thereby giving them access to their techniques and turning them into sorcerers. This is similar to what happened with Junpei back in Season 1, where Mahito did the same to activate his curse technique. Now, the next question, how did he use Idle Transfiguration? This one I think is more straightforward, but just for the sake of being thorough, he was able to use Idle Transfiguration because when a cursed spirit manipulation user absorbs a semi-grade 1 or higher cursed spirit, these are the ones with innate techniques, if they then decide to expel these cursed spirits via Uzumaki, they can extract the technique and keep it. However, this is a one-time use. They don't permanently keep the technique forever after that. That'd be OP. Technically, that fact isn't revealed until nearly 70 chapters from now, and so probably wouldn't make it into the anime until near the end of Season 3. But I know it's what most people are immediately going to ask, and it really should have been addressed sooner than it was. So, Getont uses his one-time use idle transfiguration, and injects it into Tengen's barrier, similar to the way you'd use a domain expansion. If you'll remember from the beginning of the season, Tengen's barrier is ever-present throughout Japan, and is used to support and bolster the Jujutsu Sorcerers of Jujutsu High. How can Getont use this barrier in this way? Well, it's never really been explicitly explained, but the conclusion I've come to is that as Getont is over a thousand years old, and as Kusagabe pointed out, has ridiculous barrier techniques himself, 
It must be some advanced application of jujutsu that Gatone knows from his ridiculous level of knowledge and skill acquired over the course of a thousand years. So, by injecting Tengen's Barrier with the technique, Gettont effectively creates a giant domain around all of Japan that allows him to use Idle Transfiguration on anyone at will. This allows him to do the things involving the reincarnated and newly awakened sorcerers mentioned earlier. So then, the last thing to address is his motive. Why bother with all this? Well, this gets into tropey territory, as basically Gettont embodies a lot of the immortal body hopper tropes you might be familiar with if you've seen them in other anime or manga, where basically the character's morals degrade over time due to their immortality making them feel as if they're above the rest of humanity, and with that immortality comes boredom that leads the character to start experimenting in unethical ways, usually towards the end goal of realizing some kind of evolution in the rest of humanity either to bring them up to the same level as the immortal person or simply just to alleviate their boredom. So basically, Gettont has been planning for a very long time to try and optimize Cursed Energy to elevate humanity to the pinnacle of its potential, by any means necessary. Now, how exactly making all these new sorcerers and making them fight each other achieves this isn't clear at this point in the story, but it is eventually explained in greater detail later. So I will leave that to you to discover either by waiting for the anime to get there, reading the manga yourself to find out, or just googling it, I guess, if you want to do it the boring way. The last thing I want to clear up is Yuki's reference to LaRue and her comrades. Again, this isn't really explicitly explained even in the original Japanese text of the manga, but the translation layer into English makes the vagueness even harder to parse and more confusing. I think the implication here is supposed to be that Yuki has recruited LaRue, who you'll remember is the uh, buff person with the heart pasties that broke up the fight between Nanako, Mimiko, Suda, and Negi after Geto's death. He said he would go his own way, so it would make sense that he would end up working with Yuki as she works to oppose the person controlling Geto's body. Whether she has any other comrades is hard to say, and besides, I'm not sure it matters anyway as it doesn't really come up again. Hopefully, I've managed to cover everything that could be considered confusing in enough detail to clear everything up as much as possible without spoiling things. Lastly, let's finish out the season with the bonus pages from these chapters in the manga. For these, we just get a couple character sketches. The first is of Getont, which I've edited the name out of since it reveals the name the character actually comes to be known by, which hasn't been revealed in the anime and won't be until season 3, unfortunately. The other is of Yuki. And that's my episode recap and story analysis for the 23rd episode and season finale of the second season of Jujutsu Kaisen. YouTube has apparently started making the buttons light up if the words thumbs up are used in the video, so hit that like button when you see the pretty RGB lights. The same is true for subscribe, and make sure to turn on bell notifications if you want to be here as soon as possible whenever the next time I put out a new video is, and feel free to drop a comment with suggestions as to other videos you might like to see, such as character analysis videos, explanations, or some other thing you'd like to see me make a video on. Thanks for watching.